Alright you guys, welcome back to the NASA Punk channel. We've got something a little exciting for you today. There's apparently been a new Todd Howard interview from Bethesda themselves. Uh, you've got a representative of Bethesda Game Studios here questioning Todd Howard about certain aspects of the game and answering some questions. And the cool thing about this is that we actually get some new insights into gameplay. We get like a little preview or sneak peek at the dialogue system. And I gotta say, honestly, I wasn't even aware when this video dropped. I had no idea. It's kind of strange how every other content creator that's made a video on this so far knew about it dropping. Uh, you see, if you go to Starfield's website on Bethesda.net, you've got an option to join a group called Constellation. And if you join Constellation, you're supposed to get the latest updates, news, content, anything new about Starfield. You're supposed to have kind of a leg up on that. Uh, what's funny about this video is it kind of ghost dropped. I got no updates, no email about it, no notification from the YouTube channel, nothing on social media. Uh, and it's kind of strange, but uh... You can see that actually on YouTube, it's it's unlisted. If you look at this part of the video here, it shows that the video was released, but not listed for some reason. I'm not really sure what that's all about. Maybe you guys know something more about it, but anyway, I'm not complaining. I'm just saying, I guess I wish I knew that this video was going to drop so I could prepare to make something about it, because I've actually got two other videos in the works and uh, ideas for another one. So this kind of caught me off guard. But uh, regardless, let's go ahead and look into this and, uh, and see what Bethesda has to offer as far as insights into Starfield in this new interview. The hard sci-fi, and I know that that's one of the things that's been hotly debated in the community. Is Starfield considered a hard sci-fi? I never quite know, like, because that's always like, what do they think it is if you say yes or no? I think it is more hard to us, hard, hard science fiction, where you can draw that line from, okay, here's what... Here's how man explored space, and you can like even look at our ships and say, all right, that has some you know visual identity back to that. But it's a trap question because it's a video game, right? Like a hard science fiction video game would be you die in space cold. And a good example, we were really into fuel and how the gravity drive works, and like I'm reading papers on like quantum physics and you know bending space in front of you. You don't actually warp, you bend the space, you bring the space towards you. And so what we were playing that and it became like very punitive to the player. Your ship would run out of fuel and the game would just stop. You just want to get back to what you're doing. So we've recently changed it where the fuel in your ship and the grav drive limits how far you could go at once, but it doesn't run out of fuel. Maybe there'll be an update or a mod that allows that, but that's what we're doing now. Okay, so it sounds like what he's saying there uh, is that they actually had a system in place, this, this sort of hard sci-fi space travel system, where if you ran out of fuel, your ship would just be stranded in the middle of space. And I guess they figured that was kind of arduous, kind of unnecessary. So they decided to make it to where before you plot your destination, before you can travel to a star system, a planet, whatever it may be, you already have to have the grav jump capability and enough fuel to get there. So you're not going to be flying your ship and run out of fuel mid-flight. So it's not something you're going to have to actively keep up with as you're flying and watch your fuel levels. Uh, and I know to some of you guys that are, you know, more into the hardcore space sim kind of element, um, that might be a little disappointing to you because uh, you'd rather kind of control your ship entirely and always have to be aware uh, of its controls, its, its shields, its weapons, its fuel, all that. But it appears they've changed it now to where you won't actively have to pay so much attention to your fuel while you're flying. You'll just have to make sure you have enough to get to the place where you have sort of plotted your destination. So that, I thought that was pretty interesting. Let's, uh, let's continue on. Constellation members are excited about the character customization and the traits in the game. Can you talk more about what players will experience with the traits? I love our trait list, it's super fun. But each one obviously comes with some sort of negative as well. And we have a way in the game, kind of an activity or quest you can do to remove that trait, as opposed to, don't like my character, I want to start over. Each of them are something like that you can solve that removes the entire trait for the rest of your playthrough. Okay, so that's really cool. It sounds like they want to give you a little more long-term control uh, and sort of decision-making on the build of your character throughout the, the longevity of your playthrough. So you're not just confined to the traits that you pick for your character. Um, because like we talked about before, there are caveats that come with every trait. It's always sort of a boost to your character or something uh, that gives you sort of a leg up. But also, 
undercuts you in some way, takes something away from you. You know, for every upside, there's a downside. That's kind of what the traits are about. But Todd Howard here seems to be saying that there will be some kind of optional quest line or additional task that you can uh, complete or live up to eventually, where if you want to respect your character as far as their traits, or you don't like what you've got, you can effectively remove those traits entirely. Uh, and sort of rebuild your character's traits. So that's pretty cool. And uh, another thing I wanted to talk about, you can see it just on the screen there. I talked about it in my last video, but we finally know what alien DNA is there. You can see it says, you volunteered for a controversial experiment that combines alien and human DNA. As a result, you start with a higher health pool and greater endurance, but healing items aren't as effective. Okay, so that's what that's all about there. So uh, apparently it involves a science experiment you were a part of, I guess, that changes your DNA. So I mean, I, you know, I had a feeling that it was something like that. So, uh, you know, I'm assuming that when it says alien DNA, it's just talking about some of the various life forms, alien life forms they've found on these different planets that we've settled or explored. Uh, it doesn't really speak much to there being intelligent life in this universe outside of the human race, but you know, it's still something. It's pretty neat that uh, we finally get an explanation on what alien DNA is as a trait. So there you have it. And one last thing before we move on. Uh, I noticed they took out the starter home trait. Where you would start with a home on a peaceful moon. But you had to pay monthly, like this mortgage or something on it. So you'd constantly have this debt you were having to pay to have this home. Uh, but they've replaced that now, it seems, with one called Dream Home. And it says, you own a luxurious, customizable house on a peaceful planet. So it's on a planet instead of a moon now. Unfortunately, it comes with a 50,000 credit mortgage with Gal Bank that has to be paid weekly. So it seems like it's a little bit steeper, a little more expensive to have this new Dream Home as opposed to the original Starter Home trait. Uh, but you know what? It's on a whole planet now instead of a moon. So, <laughs> I mean... You know, maybe that has its own upside to it, right? But anyway, let's move on to the next thing. The last question, we have speech checks and dialogue that reflect your character build. Do you want to expand upon that at all? Yeah, look, we've done a lot of different dialogue systems. And we've gone back to kind of a, I'll call it like a classic Bethesda style dialogue with you're looking at the character and how they emote. You have a series of choices there. The, the scope of the game, the amount of content we're making is a bit more than we've done before in terms of quests and things like that, but the depth in some of this stuff with the dialogue, we just passed 250,000 lines. And so that's a lot of dialogue. For sure, that's a ton of dialogue compared to Skyrim and Fallout 4. I mean, Fallout 4 had less than half the amount of dialogue that Starfield currently has. And Fallout 4 had almost twice as much dialogue as Skyrim. So. It kind of harkens back to a video I made a while back, if you remember, it was called Why Starfield is Going to be Massive. And in this video, I talked about one of the reasons why the game was going to be massive, because it had so much dialogue lines compared to Skyrim in it. Um, and you could see from that video that it rings true now. Uh, the dialogue is almost 250,000 lines. Um, so I'm not really sure what that equates to as far as you know, how many characters they're going to be to talk to or, or how complex or diverse the lines are. But I feel like a lot of that's just because of how much choice and consequence in dialogue there is. You're going to see a lot more complexity as far as the things you can say to characters and how they react and what they have to say based on this information we have here. So that's pretty exciting. But we've gone through it and the impact is really there. And that includes my favorite speech persuasion system. You're not talking us out of this score. It feels like it's part of the dialogue, but you're spending points to persuade them. You willing to give up the ship just like that? It feels natural, not like I've entered some other mode where we're not, I'm not doing regular dialogue. It's just I'm in this mode of persuading you uh, to get what I want. All right, so what we have here is our first bit of gameplay in months. So let's take a look at this. Uh, obviously, the player character is talking to some space pirates here. Um, the Crimson Fleet, it appears to be. You can see they're wearing crimson. They have the skull helmets. That's a dead giveaway there. Uh, it looks like the dialogue system here is going to be pretty pretty well set up, uh, pretty intricate. You've got uh, sort of like your classic Bethesda games. You've got the persuade option there where you can say, there's no treasure in my ship cut your losses before more people get hurt or you can just go on the attack and say time to make the settled systems a safer place 
And then there's there's the uh, the neutrality option there, the whole let's get along with, I don't suppose we can just agree to disagree, no hard feelings. Uh, I for one don't think that that option will go down very well with the Crimson Fleet, but you know, it's there, it's an option, you can always play that and see how it goes for you. Um, it's really interesting if you take a look at the options you have here after using the persuade tactic there, um, it looks like there's a, uh, a persuasion points system, like Todd Howard was referring to earlier. Um, and one thing I'm not sure about, it says there are turns. Oh, three. It's like you have three turns to be able to persuade someone, maybe, if that's what you choose. Like you have, if you can't persuade them in three turns, maybe their persuasion fails altogether. And you have to have the persuasion points to be able to effectively persuade someone. You can see there's a plus one, plus three, plus four, plus five. So I'm assuming that there's like a certain amount of points you have to have depending on what your like charisma level is. Um, and then if you have enough points to cover that option, it'll be more effective at persuading someone. Or maybe you'll be able to persuade them quicker or easier or get a better outcome depending on how effective your persuasion is. Um, and I'm sure depending on your different stats and traits and background and all that, that uh, persuasion of people will have different outcomes uh, depending on how effective you are in that skill. So looking at the dialogue options here, it appears that you fought your way through an entire crew of space pirates to arrive in front of this commander or lieutenant of the group, and it seems like they think there is something valuable on your ship, or they want to take it or take what you have. And your first option there is, you have it wrong. Constellation is an explorer's group. They aren't treasure hunters. Uh, your second option is, hey, if you want to trade ships, that sounds good to me. The frontier creaks when it turns anyway. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, my ship sucks. Go ahead and take it. Just let me have yours. And the third option is, I mean, if you want to embarrass yourself, go right ahead. And uh, so it, that's a plus four. And it looks like uh, there's like tiers of persuasion based on how many points you have. And starting from top to bottom, they get sort of mild to aggressive. And I think that like the, the lower down the list, basically the more points are required. And so like it's more effective. And so, because you, you can see like the plus five at the very end there is the sort of intimidation tactic. That's kind of like the surefire way to get people to back off if you can pull it off. I just made it past your entire crew. You really want to try your luck against me. You know, it'll get them thinking like, oh, I better not mess with this guy because he took out my other guy. So I feel like that uh, that last option there in most cases is going to be the nail in the coffin to somebody who you're trying to persuade, essentially. Having a way with words might prove useful. That's it. That's all the questions that I had for today. Yeah, this has been great. You know, everybody out there, you know, keep it coming. We do really read it all. And also, we look forward to showing you more of the game in the future as well. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. That's all we have for today. But don't forget, you can submit your questions at the hashtag below. See you later. All right, you guys, that's pretty much the gist of the interview. While there was a little more content towards the beginning, it wasn't as relevant to the game. But if you want to watch the whole video, I've got it uh, posted down below in the description. You can click on the link there to watch the full original video where Todd Howard actually talks about some of his inspirations and compares Starfield to some older classic games like Sundogs. But anyway, be sure to subscribe to stay updated on the latest Starfield content and tune in for the next video as we look forward to the future.